Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Marshall. Um, I'm a member of the... This is going to go on all morning. The smoke still hasn't gone away, unfortunately. <coughs> um, I'm a member of Wildlife Carers Network. Uh, was wise, still work heavily with them for those that keep saying we've gone to wise. Uh, we both cover this area down in the valley, plus large areas out in Mudkey and the like. Um, I've been in native animal care now for about 30 years. Um, I'm also, and we're talking about emotions and things a while ago, uh, I'm also a rural fire service captain and we've just gone through 11 weeks of um, bushfires around our valley and other places. And um, unfortunately, I've seen some of the worst things that could happen to native animals and I've seen some of the probably better stories as well as we go along. Um, so emotions are fairly raw here. Uh, especially to the residents as well, who for 11 weeks are wondering if they're going to lose their homes, their properties and things. And um, fortunately we've been very successful in what we've done. Um, it's still not finished. Uh, we've still got one up at Kerry Ridge, which is over the other side of uh, the, at the valley there. And there's every chance that uh, come Wednesday that the hot edges may kick in there as well. So it's still not over for us, unfortunately. But done well. Okay, just a few things. Um, been watching social media an awful lot, and it's it's brilliant if it's used for the right reasons. But it also is one of the greatest amount of rubbish coming out about what you do with native animals at this time of the year and with what the problems we've got. Um, I've seen pictures of redneck wallabies being fed bread. I've seen wildlife groups, I won't name any of them, over the Temple Coastway, who made up some beautiful packs to take out and stick out, and it went, it went all over Facebook. And the whole lot was plastered with brisica, or cabbage family, all over the top. Mm. Definite no-nos, you know. Um, where does a redneck wallaby, you ever seen him in a shop buying a loaf of bread? <laughs> nope. Likely. The local duck at Lawson Park in Mudgee, the wild duck, you ever seen him down to the fish and chip shop? But we still pour the fish and chips down the throat. <laughs> and with a lot of the um, gut flora and that of our animals, uh, feeding them the wrong things, even though it's well intentioned, and I'm not saying I, I had one person here on Facebook that I saw had heard and misunderstood and she went out and bought a bag of potatoes. Now potatoes will poison animals. Uh, she just misunderstood that we were talking about, or somebody was talking about sweet potatoes. So what we're about today is what we can do to help them. Uh, and I think what we need to do people today as well as in the future, a little bit less of this, a little bit more of this, so that we understand what we're doing wrong and what we're doing right. We'll talk about humanising and gut flora and that we go along. The other thing we've got to separate today, I think, is everybody is seeing this um, burnt koalas and this sort of thing and that sort of thing. That's not what we're here for today. That is wildlife carers business. That is native animal hospital business. Basically what we're here, I think, today is to do is to talk about the interim short term survive of the natives that we've got around here due to habitat loss and due to whatever, the drought and so forth and so on. And I'd also split it into areas where it's food deficient and where it's not food deficient at this stage. Now, I know we're in heavy drought, but I'm not seeing starving kangaroos in the Cape Dee Valley. Uh, they are still getting their pick. Uh, I'm not seeing starving wombats in the Cape Dee Valley, although the properties are now starting to look like wild pigs are digging up it, but they're not. The wombats will dig up the roots of the grass and eat that. So we've got to be very careful we don't overfeed them and take them away from the normal gut floor and so forth and so on. The ones that I think really need to be looked at are the ones that have been heavily impacted by the fire around the area. Now, Cape Dee Valley, sure, it came down onto the edges of it, but it didn't burn out. 90% of the valley is still there. The bushland is still there. Um, I've been grabbing possums at the bushfires that have burnt things. They're healthy possums other than the burns. Uh, macropods are not really showing a great deal of stress in these areas at the moment. So where I think we need to concentrate more is in the heavily impacted areas from the fire rather than the areas that we're talking about here. You drive up there now, Someone up the valley here the other day had 32 mils of rain. It's going green. Mm. So 
their natural food is coming back. But for areas like, say, Round Swamp or um, the back of Airlie Mine, uh, all of this Pine Grove area, uh, Crown Station Road, Ken Davis Road, round through Razorback, where there's been heavy loss of habitat, and particularly the people in the national parks down here are aware of what the loss of habitat they've had within their parks. It's enormous. The last I heard, I think the water mine was almost 100% destroyed. I think that's probably been achieved by this stage, unfortunately except for a few pines and things that they were able to save. So we've got to look at what's best for the area where there is still food and don't overfeed, what is best for the areas that are heavily impacted where there's no possum food left due to crown fires and the like, what we need to put on the ground and what we need to uh, put in the trees as well. I've had a few problems with well-meaning group that came into the valley um, they're not a New South Wales first group and not critical of people trying to help, but get it right please. They were feeding arboreal animals water and food on the ground. Now, anybody that knows what a boreal animal is, up here. It doesn't come down to the ground to feed. It eats leaves, it eats this and that. And they put the food stations and the water stations on the ground for arboreal animals. Now, the native, well not the native cat, the feral cats here are quite prolific. Um, I've seen heaps of wild dogs coming out of the parks and that when we've been at the fires. Uh, I've seen stacks of pigs. Uh, we bump a thing with a bulldozer and a sow and about eight young ones come screaming out of it. So the whole lot has moved out into this thing here. Now, the predators will soon learn where that feed station is. So they will say, oh yes, this is easy. We'll go and we'll sit around this and before all the posse comes down or whatever. And he's gone, he's lunchtime with the parrot and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make sure that when we feed, we don't feed in the same place all the time. We've got to move it around. And please don't take dogsy for a walk while you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Our native animals stress very badly. Now if you're going to go take your dogsy for a walk and you put food on the ground and the cat comes with you, they again learn where the stations are. The roos and what have you smell the dog and they stress. Now stress myopathy, and particularly in eastern grey kangaroo, is generally fatal. It will kill them. So we've got to do not stress the animals as well. So be careful where you feed. If it's for arboreals, make sure it's up off the ground. Make sure the water is up off the ground. And if it's a, if it's a land mammal, of course, we then feed on the ground and so forth. But we then have to sort of work out where we're going to feed heavily, where we're not going to feed heavily, how long we do it for. I'm starting to see areas in Capey Valley where maybe one or two weeks feeding is all that's necessary because it's simply starting to green again. And if we're starting to feed non-native food to them, there's a lot of problems that come in with that as well. Um, for instance, I uh, had a group again who came and donated a lot of food and mixed in with that food were bags of dog food. So again it's well meaning but it's so full of things that you know treatments within that food. It's not a natural food and it's got chemicals and so forth but they, they were feeding dog food. I've had one wombat that I had to retrain to eat grass because someone had continually fed it alpaca pellets. It didn't know what grass was. So we create these problems while we're trying to help as well. Okay. A few of the things too, when we start to feed the animals and so forth, um, they become problem animals after it stops. And a silly old bugger like me has got to go out and euthanise problem animals. Right? I don't like euthanasia, I hate it. But what I'm talking about is just humanising that. Kangaroo is grass, true. Kangaroo probably eats a bit of bark off a tree. If he's a browser like a, a, a redneck or a swampy or a wallaroo, browser is just as much off the tree. And while we're talking about wallaroos, do they need a lot of water? No, they don't because they get most of their moisture from what they eat. They're a very dry gutted animal, a wallaroo. Wombat's a very dry gutted animal. So we then teach them to accept things like, uh, say, loosen which is one of the more common things that people are feeding them these days. Get you out of trouble? Yeah, but high protein content in lucent 
it's not good for a native animal's gut. It gives it the runs. So therefore, we've got to not overfeed lose them. Uh, kangaroo pellets, you pick them out of a bag now, what colour are they? Green generally? Yep. What, what colour's loosen? So therefore, the kangaroo pellets again are a very high in protein. Uh, wheat and char, oat and char, all shouldn't be fed to them because of this protein content in it. Okay? So we try to keep that amount. Feed it by all means, but what I'm saying is, in Caperty Valley, don't go out and throw a bale of loosen on the ground and walk away from it here because it doesn't need the bale of loosen. Round swamp it probably does because it's totally burnt out. There's nothing there for them anymore. And there's little covens of them over there. We're getting reports all the time where these groups of animals are, are, are um, sort of collecting and they've got no food. It's probably okay to chuck a bale of loosen out for them. But we've got to not overfeed them on this type of stuff. Um, I'll give you a bit of a rough idea of what um, some of the no-nos are. And I don't think kangaroo pellets have got it in it anymore, but there was a company down in southern New South Wales that was making kangaroo pellets. And one of the big problems with group feeding of any court is we have coccidiosis in our roos. Now, there's about 20 different varieties of coccidiosis. They get it from grazing on species, areas where they feed and what have you. And it is generally fatal to them. It's a horrible death. They die a horrible, painful death. They, they poo blood. They, they, they're in agony when they've got this coxie. Now, generally, the larger of the roos tend to tolerate it, but it knocks the little fellas off. Now, they were making a product, and it was, I don't know, it was lazuloid, which is a chemical they were putting in it, which was a pre-treatment within the food they were making to prevent coxie in the roos. It's fatal to roots, this vessel to eat. Now, the last time I saw this particular company, they um, weren't advertising any type of chemical in it, but they were suggesting that you contact your vets about how to treat coccidiosis. And really, there's not a treatment for it, unfortunately. It's a, it's a disease that's in them. Uh, and as I say, the little ones are very susceptible to it. They do tend to feed pig baycocks and that to them, but I think in the long term you're going to lose the roo and uh, it, it, it can knock them over though. You'll generally see them sit, paws go down, they look lethargic, start to smell poo and what have you, and generally within 24 hours they, they, they die of pain from that on the ground. Uh, this is another thing that we've got to watch with this group feeding. We don't bring diseases in to those areas. Now, let's talk about, say, parrots. There's a thing called pig and feather that's in the parrot family. Um, you'll see them, uh, you'll see them, uh, all their feathers are gone, their beaks breaking up and falling off, or it's grown grotesquely out of shape. I've seen gang gangs with the bottom beak in on the back of their tongue, it's grown around that, the top beak around here under its jaw like that. Now, group feeding introduces the diseases to the other animals as well. You've got to be very careful, you don't try and encourage too many of them into the one spot. One bird dying of beak and feather is probably alright. A couple dying of starvation is probably alright. But do we kill another 30 feeding them by encouraging them to come together like that sort of thing with this, 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 this beak and feather that's in there? Uh, sulfur crest is a bad with it out around Mudgee. Uh, it's very rife in the gang gangs on the Blue Mountains. Um, I've seen pretty healthy ones out home. But, again, we've got to be very careful about group feeding them so that we don't introduce disease to each other and things like that as well. So, John, could we clarify, group feeding means you start putting stuff down in one place and just you keep replenishing it yeah. so they keep yeah. coming to the same yeah. place. So yeah. even if it's good food, it being consistent like that yeah. can cause it's a It's a viral disease, we can feather. Um, there's another one that we can get called psittacosis. It's like pneumonia, which in the birds. It doesn't kill the birds and it doesn't kill us, but we have to get treated. Quite a few wildlife carers get psittacosis each year. It comes on like pneumonia. But, yeah, it, it needs to be moved around, in my opinion, so that we don't... Because they all stand, sit there and they defecate on the ground, they pee on the ground and what have you. And if you're going to go back and feed in that same station all the time, mm. it's probably manure that's got this coccidiosis in it or, it's, you know, so forth and so on. So don't feed them in the same place all the time. Feed them in a different spot so that it's nice and clean for them, and that way you probably might not get so much of the problem with them. 
Now, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is this humanising with them. Now, this is where we start running into trouble. They are wild animals, they must remain wild animals. When we're under our licence, anything that we bring into care has to be released as a wild animal in as good a condition or better than when it first succumbed to its injury or whatever you've got the thing in care for. You don't pet them, you don't talk to them or anything like that. Don't stand there putting them out. The lovely little skippies all hanging around. Hi guys, how you going? Oh wow, wow. They lose their fear of humans, they lose their fear of animals, they lose their fear of everything and the next time something walks up to it, poor old skippy's gone. So don't hang around talking to them when you're feeding them. Please make sure that you allow to be native animals, okay? Now, what can happen with humanising? Well, that's when I start getting phone calls or Linda starts getting phone calls. John, the cocky's eating me house. It's eating all the insulation off the electric wires. Oh, were you feeding them? Oh, yeah. So you've enticed cockies to come to your house and chew the bejeebas out of your veranda and eat all the insulation off your power wires and if cocky crosses two of them and one puff of black smoke and pop, cocky's gone anyway. Right. Oh, John, there's a wombat under my house and it's wrecked all my plumbing. Or were you feeding them? Yeah, in the backyard. But the worst one of the lot is the big macropods. I'll give you a couple of examples of ones that I've had to shoot. They get used to you giving it an apple. Yeah? Great. That's an apple. Why do you think the dingoes killed that little boy on Fraser Island? Because the people had humanised them to the point of re relying on food that was handed out. The minute that poor young kid was wandering through the bush and didn't have the food to hand the dingo, it killed him. And the same thing is happening with our macropods. Big buck kangaroo, he's a big fella. Ooh, only Schwarzenegger. Huh? Little wallaroos are just as big, but they will gut you. They will grab you and they will bring both major toes down and they'll disembowel you. Because you've suddenly come out and you haven't got what you've been feeding the damn thing. So it gets cranky. It's still a wild animal. Even with its claws, it'll rip you to pieces. It'll bite you. It'll bite chunks out of you. Oh, I've been attacked by a kangaroo, John. Oh, have you? Okay. What were you doing? Oh, I've been feeding it and I walked out accidentally just now and I eyeballed it and I looked at it instead of going like this and it past it. And it kicked me. So what's John got to do? There's only one answer for that kangaroo. Mm. That's euthanasia. Mm. So the person that's feeding it is not bloody well done the right thing by the animal. They have humanised to the point where it becomes a Bilpin fruit bowl. Everybody knows Bilpin fruit bowl and the bells on a row. Okay. Tourists used to come there, this is years ago when I lived down in the Hawkesbury. There was a big wild eastern grey kangaroo who used to come up out of the bush and all the tourists feeding <coughs> said kangaroo apples. A couple of Japanese tourists wandered down this day, oh look at the skippy, ho ho ho, never had an apple for it. Belted the crap out of the pair of them. John's got to go up to the fruit bowl of Bilton, shoot the kangaroo. We don't need that. Wombats will attack you. Think you can outrun one? Nah, 40 k's an hour at the trot. They're, bold. they're not long stayers, they're just boulders, and if you can get away from them for the first 100 yards, you've got them beat. They will bite chunks out of you because you've been feeding them. But, uh, would I be right, sir? They've got to stay native animals, haven't they? Yeah? Okay. It's like what they're doing up in the park at the moment. Would I feed carrots to kangaroos or any of the native animals? No, I wouldn't. Would I feed them to the brush-tailed rock wallaby in the National Park, yes I would, because they don't have a choice of what they're feeding them, okay? Down here, everybody heard of 1080, that dreadful stuff that killed animals? What do they bait rabbits with? Carrots, poison ivy. 1080 on what? Carrots. Carrots. So it's not wrong out in the National Park, because the chance of a 1080 bait being dropped in a carrot in the National Park, that's good. But don't do the same blasted thing down here with them, because they will see a carrot, rabbit time, phew, either fox talks down the burrow or 1080, and watch the rule somebody go, oh, there's a carrot. Ah, what, why, what do we use instead? Sweet potato, maybe. Beautiful thing for native animals. 
don't make them reliant on it. But is sweet potato used with 1080? No, it's not. So therefore, you've introduced it to a particular type of food that is not going to be poisoned later on so that the poor damn thing suffers from it. Uh, but yeah, look, this humanising people, it is bad news. And uh, they will take you to pieces, especially the big buck roos. They don't muck around at all. Generally, a roo attack. You surprise a big buck with his girls, he will probably go at you. If you go like this and walk away, not interested. But if he's humanised to you, haven't got what he wants. My wife's sitting out here, and she'll remember. Went to the koala park at West Pennant Hills years ago with our eldest girl, who was a little baby in a stroller. Walked into this enclosure where the emus were and kicked the crap out of my daughter because we never had the peanuts that other people had been feeding it. Mm. Yeah, watch it in the stroll. So please, do you understand that? Do not teach them to be pet animals. Okay, just go through quickly. I know you've still got other things to do. You can start throwing rocks if I'm talking too long. <laughs> um, some of the no no's, and I'll just make sure I cover all these people. Just. Um, but certainly no-nos for any of our things are uh, guinea pig pellets. <laughs> no, no way in the world you feed them guinea pig pellets. Uh, any rat type uh, food that you buy. I breed my own rats and things because I do red clover as well. But you don't make sure that they don't get that. Uh, dog food is a definite no-no because of all the treatments that are in it. <coughs> Lettuce leaves. Australia I think is about two on the list of a number of things and I haven't got the list with me of the chemicals that are put on to the vegetables that we buy at the supermarket. And lettuce is one of the top ones where they use so many different chemicals on them. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> You're a vegetarian, are you? That's a quite a day, didn't it? Come get my lettuce, Julie. <laughs> yeah. They, but there is a terrible lot of straw <laughs> strawberries are heavily chemical treated, mm. uh, uh, lettuce are heavily chemical. Tomatoes are heavy chemical treatment because it's root on that. And it's still in them when you buy it. So that, what are you going to do now, Jill? Grow more of my... Oh, oh, Eat my mine. Go to the garden place. With your garden place. Get your local garden <laughs> <car, laughs> place. That's the only way, guys. Um, bread. The brassica family, which consists of cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi, Brussels sprout, cauliflower, uh, causes severe bloating in them. And I get that occasionally. It's not very pleasant. <laughs> Uh, and they build up oxalates in the digestive tract. Now, all of our native animals work on a gut floor reversely, other than carnivores and that. But anything like the macropods, wombats and that, they work on fermentation in the gut. It's the rear gut in the kangaroo. So what they do is they chomp it in and it goes down here and it's like a good wine. It ferments in the gut. Now, we never ever when we were going through a vet, we never ever give oral antibiotics to a native animal because it kills the gut flora. We've got to build it again. Any uh, antibiotics go in this way. But if you kill the gut flora on them by using something that does that, they can die out in a while because um, how do we get it going? Rupu. You go and find some good clean rupu out in the paddock somewhere and you mix it up into a brew and you force that down the kangaroo's throat to rebuild this fermentation. Do we spoil a good wine? I'm, I'm not a drinker, but do we spoil a good wine brewing away like this by pouring charcoal and other things in it? No, we don't. It's the same with their flora. You kill the flora, and they don't have the thing. One of the calls we get sometimes, John, there's a kangaroo and it's sick. What's it doing? Oh, it's standing there and it punches over and it starts going... <laughs> Poor impression, but it does do that. It's trying to vomit. No! Natural process it's called mericism. So please don't ring up when you see kangaroos doing this in the paddock, because now that there's more coming closer to the people, they're starting to see these things they've never seen before. What is it? Simply the kangaroo regurgitating from its gut up here, changing the pH level of the food it's just eaten, and swallowing it again. <laughs> Similar cow chew on its cut. So you see them sitting there. They're not poisoned. They're not dying. Okay. Um, Loose and only in small amounts, uh, has too much protein in it. Um, gut flora, we've talked about that. Um, possums virtually pretty well the same thing. No, none of the cabbage family at all, but try and stick with the things like apple, um, um, sweet potato. It's my favourite, is the sweet potato. They delight in the thing. Um, 
uh, for wombats, no dog food, uh, muesli oats. Uh, shouldn't feed anything to native animals that's got oats in it. Um, it is a, a body warmer. It will warm the body. Uh, and also with kangaroos, uh, quite often they'll get the seed down between their teeth and their gum and they get what we call lumpy jaw. And it's a, it's a euthanasia job. You'll see them around the paddocks and they've got this massive swelling on the side of their face. It's an infection because the oats has gone down between the teeth and the thing. Rolled oats, different thing altogether because it's fairly well broken up. But straight out oats, no. Um, now, one of the good things. Just again as a supplementary feed, it's not a permanent thing, people. Um, there are a couple of products of horse food. Uh, Barristock uh, Complete Performance, one of them. Uh, it's locally available at uh, CRT and places like that. And there's another one called Calm Performer or something. Oh, cool. 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 It's, 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 it's a horse food. Yeah, they're like cool temperature ones. Yes, cool temperature yeah. food. It doesn't have oats in it, it doesn't have anything that's going to raise them. Um, one thing that is in most of them, and sugar's not something that should be introduced too much, it does have a small amount of molasses in it, but animals seem to enjoy the molasses. That's what I feed. If I, I've got native animals in care, and just before you get them onto grass, you start. Wombats thrive on it, but it's. Uh, it's any of those cool horse foods, don't get the other ones at all. They've got to be cool performance type of thing. John, can I just please comment on that? I'm, I'm Sue from Wyatt at, at Bathurst. Yes, um, none of the pony pellets and things and the stud mixes that have rice based products in them mm -hmm. either because macropods yep. um, and marsupials can't digest rice based yep. products and, and a lot of the, these cool formulas are based on, on rice. So please uh, get good at reading your labels and yep. no, 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 no rice. Uh, products or rice bran or rice pollard. Yeah, yeah, particularly a, they, a definite no-no's no for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's fine. <coughs> I sometimes overlook things. Thank you very much for that. That's what we're here for. And by the way, 